to talk about that, I want to invite my colleague up here, Nicolas DDA, uh, who's our, our lead research scientist on the QPU team. <clears throat> Thanks, Andrew. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so today I'd like to tell you how, uh, at the hardware level, we're improving the performance of, via of the virtual control algorithm you are running on our hardware. And for that, I'll focus on four topics on which we are working. Uh, the first one is uh, the two qubit fidelity. Uh, I'll show you that we improve the current time of our qubits to improve the two qubit fidelities of our QPUs. Uh, next topic is the size of the lattice of connected qubit we have on our platform. I'll show you that we are developing quantum control to, Im to get around imperfections and provide the largest uh, possible uh, lattice to you. Uh, next is I will present you the new uh, uh, gates that are available now uh, on QCS, the XY gate family, and show you that uh, they are very useful to help you compile your algorithm down to a shorter depth on our hardware. And finally, I'll show you how we are reducing correlated errors on our QPUs by building architect architecture with low crosstalk. So I'll start by briefly telling you how we perform two qubit gates. Um, here is a two qubit chip that we used three years ago. Ah, sorry. Uh, it's still the basic unit we use now for when we build 32 qubit chips, but as you can imagine, a lot of improvement. Um, we use superconducting circuits. Uh, they are the magic element there is these JSON junctions to build highly controllable artificial atom. Uh, the basic unique is made of uh, frequency tunable qubit, capacitively coupled to a fixed frequency qubit. So, uh, um, so we can control the frequency of the tunable qubit with flux uh, biases that we send on this line here through the loop of where there are the jets and junctions. And we design our chips such that the qubits are more detuned that they are coupled, such that at rest, they don't interact. And then performing two qubit gates is all about controlling the interaction between the qubits with high accuracy. And to do so, we send uh, radio frequency flux pulses down to the flux line. So when we modulate the tunable qubit, now it's, this qubit will be defined from its average frequency of under modulation. And the modulation gives rise to sidebands around this average frequency. And the distance between the sidebands are set by the modulation frequency we send on the qubit. So we can tune this modulation frequency such that one of the sidebands will fall on resonance with the fixed qubit that is coupled to it. And at that point, you activate fast current exchange between the two qubits. And if in this condition I solve for the equation and calculate the evolution operator, this is what you get. You get uh, rotation between state zero one and one zero. And you see that if you tune well the gate time, this evolution operator becomes the unitary matrix for I-swap gates. So this is how we, we perform I-swap gates on our platform. And the same way you can also realize control Z gates. You will send a flux pulse with a different frequency. And you will also uh, use, we also make use of second excited state of our artificial atom. So Temporarily, during the gates, we go out of the logical basis, and this enables us to perform very efficiently control these gates. So you see that our parametric gates are fully controlled from the RF tones that we send to the fridge, uh, the length and the frequency, and these are parameters that we control with high accuracy in the lab. Also because the gates are activated from resonance condition of the frequency we send, um, it enables us to deal with frequency crowding when we, we scale up our QPUs or we go with larger connectivity. So when we look at the fidelities of these two qubit gates, the main limitation is the current time of the qubit. So you know there are two of them, there is T1, which is the lifetime of state one, because in our case, state one is, in, is an excited state, so it will decay towards the ground state with this typical time scale T1. Uh, the other one is T2, the phasing time. It's the lifetime of a superposition state. So this bell state here will decay towards the mixed state with a typical time scale T2. And basically when you calculate the error of these two qubit gates, it goes like gate time over T1 and gate time over T2. So we are continuously improving the gate time of our gates, 
But in parallel, we're also improving the current time of our qubits. So Andrew showed you that uh, by improving the fabrication process, we can reach state-of-the-art T1s. Now I'd, I'd like to tell you how we work with long defacing times T2. So I told you that to uh, perform entangling gates, we use flux pulses. Unfortunately, flux control comes with flux noise, and flux noise makes the qubit frequency fluctuates, and this leads to dephase. So in practice, it's very hard to work with flux control and long dephasing time. But we have predicted that for tunable qubits under modu flux modulation, there exists a point of operation where the qubit becomes weakly sensitive to flux noise. This is what is called a sweet spot. We also predicted that to see this sweet spot, you need a control electronics that has a white noise floor low enough. So we worked with our team, uh, which is building control electronics, to build an instrument with low enough white noise floor. And this is what we got. Here, you see T2 as a function of the modulation amplitude. And you see that at some point, T2 reaches high values. Actually, these values are the one you would measure without flux control. So this is what we call full resurgence. And we couldn't see full resurgence with the commercial electronics we were using before. So this is the, the, the line in blue. It was very small resurgence there. So we now we are using our custom electronics. We are operating our qubit at sweet spots to perform high fidelity entangling gates. For instance, we were able to demonstrate fidelities up to 99.4% per, per, with this uh, two system. So this is a way to provide you the uh, better and better two qubit gate. The next point I would like to talk about is the size of the lattice of connected qubit we have on our QPUs. One of the major limitations in the yield of superconducting qubits is the presence of two-level system on the chip. These are defects that couple to our qubits. And to look at the effect, here is the uh, a frequency of a tunable qubit as a function of the flux bias. And you see that there are, there are several splittings on this curve. Each of them is a coupling, strong coupling of a two-level system to our qubit. And if this qubit cannot, oper cannot be operated at that point because you will have strong leakage towards uh, the two-level system. So to increase the yield, our teams in, at FAB are characterizing these TLSs. They are measuring a lot of qubit to measure the coupling strength of the TLSs, the density of the TLSs, so that we improve the fabrication process to reduce the number of TLSs and their coupling strength. This is at the level of single qubit yield. But at the level of the QPU, if you want to use it to use this uh, tunable qubit to perform entangling gates at the sweet spot, if the average frequency falls on a splitting there, you won't be able to use this tunable qubit to perform entangling gates. So there will be a hole in your lattice, right? But we have demonstrated that if you use, instead of a single tone for the modulation, you use two-tone modulation, a bichromatic modulation, you go from few sweet spots uh, to a con here in pink to a continuum of sweet spots over this band. So now we are using quantum control to engineer sweet spots out of this splitting so that we can increase the size of the connected lattice that we are providing to you. So I tell you, one tone, two tones, I'm sure in your mind you think about the better tone you would like to try on our hardware. Actually, now it's possible with Quilty, and uh, later today, Rob Smith will tell you more about that. Next point is circuit depth. So, uh, recently, uh, we have provided on QCS platform a new set of native gates, the XY family. This is uh, the unitary of this family, it's a rotation in the two qubit subspace with Hamming weight one, and the, the, the rotation angle here is theta. So the same way, with the same interaction that we use to generate I swap, we use it to generate this XY family. Here, the important point is that to generate the full family, we need to calibrate a single pulse. So we, we uh, square root of I swap. And then, because we have control of the phase of the flux that we send to the fridge, we combine two of these square root of I swap with different phases to explore the full family of XY gate. And as a result, you see on this pink ring that the fidelity for different angles theta is pretty constant between 96 and 99%. Uh, the same way we go from I swap to XY family, we can go from control Z to the C phase family. Why 
is this important? If you have a native gate set that is expressive, it's, easy, it's possible for you to compile your algorithm to a lower depth. And as an illustration, we have uh, performed QAOA on four qubits. Here in this case, the hardware topology is four qubits on a line here. And we perform QAOA with different graph topology, uh, circle, uh, all tool connectivity. Let's look at all-to-all -all connectivity. You need 12 CNOT. If you compile uh, this algorithm on this hardware topology with only CZs, you need 17 of them. But if you have CZ and iSwap, you need seven plus seven CZs and five iSwap, so 12 gates. So you see there is a very strong reduction of depth when you have more two qubit gates at your disposal. And, and the same for the circle, you go from eight, uh, uh, 10 to, to eight. So just to illustrate uh, qualitatively that we have better performances, we have plotted here the um, uh, cost function of QAOA as a function of the variational angles, gamma and beta. And you see that qualitatively, this uh, result here is closer to the ideal case, when, so it's when you have CZ and XY rather than, uh, better than this one when you have only CZ. It's just because you have lower depth, shorter depth. Actually, there's a very interesting result stating that if you have iSwap and CZ in your native gate set, for certain combina combinatorial problems such as max cut, the depth of the algorithm does not depend on the hardware connectivity. And this is what we saw, we see here, right? Because we started with 12 C nodes for all to all connectivity, and we ended up compiling it to 12 to qubit gates. It's the same here, eight C nodes, eight to qubit gates. Um, on top of that, our friends at NASA have showed that uh, QoA can be even more efficient if you use X-wave mixers, and this will be explained in more details later today by uh, GV1. Okay, uh, my last point was about uh, correlated errors. So correlated errors can come from the fact that when you send a pulse to a target qubit, you might uh, give rise to unwanted rotations on other qubits on the QPU. And this is mainly due to crosstalks. So as we scale up, we are developing architecture with low crosstalks. We also develop protocols to measure accurately this crosstalk to show that architecture gets better. And this is what, this is the, the um, uh, crosstalk matrix between eight tunable qubits on this 16 qubit chip. With the previous architecture, crosstalk level were, were quite high, or like at the, in the percent level. And this is, this is too high. But now, with the next generation of architecture, we could reduce this crosstalk by hard orders of magnitude, such that now we're at a level that enables us to perform simultaneous two qubit gates with high fidelity, larger than 99%. So we are not working uh, alone on this uh, stuff. We, also, we have also partners in the room to help us characterize better our chips. Uh, a particular one is um, Quantum Benchmark, uh, who is helping us with this, uh, their tool of characterization uh, protocols. And I'd like to introduce you to Joe Emerson, who will present results. 